welcome to this very special and very important event. Why is it important? Well, we'll come to that in a minute. Let's do a bit of housekeeping. My name is Matthew Battle, um, Managing Director of UK Property Forums, and my job today is to moderate. But you, like me, today is so much more. Yes, the launch of the Earth Lab, you've just come back from the fantastic tours, and you've seen a very practical demonstration, so important. But also, and you'll hear this regularly throughout today, it's a call to action. Actually, it's an opportunity with this esteemed group of people, and it really is a very special group of people, um, to hear and connect with the need to build nature in to all of our future plans and developments. I think that's a key issue. It's about thinking about how you can integrate these ideas which you see around you today into your schemes, your developments, your ideas. And on that note, who better to start this process than Mark Beard? High Sheriff, which is why he's wearing that kit. He doesn't, he doesn't just get, out, <laughs> get in it for fun. Um, it's a very serious issue. Um, High Sheriff of Oxfordshire, but also Chief Executive of Beard Construction and the contractor for the, uh, for the Earth Lab, which you've been to go and see. So, Mark, over to you, and welcome to the Earth Trust. Thank you all for coming this afternoon, and a very big welcome to the Earth Trust and the launch of the Earth Lab from the Earth Trust itself and all its partners. Um, I promised Jane that I'd wear my court dress, my tights. Um, I've got into a little bit of trouble because I didn't bring my sword, but I'll try and make up for that by saying one or two things that are relevant and complimentary, Jane, over the next few minutes. Um, in terms of the role of the High Sheriff, it's a role that goes back over a thousand years. It's still a royal appointment. Historically, the High Sheriff has been responsible for collecting taxes and dishing out punishments. That's no longer the case. We have a Chancellor of the Exchequer, we have courts. <laughs> um, but the High Sheriff still has very strong links with the judiciary, the police force, our prisons, which are often forget forgotten, the probation service. High sheriffs um, are still the returning officer in the elections that often you hear the acting returning officer refer to. The real returning officer is the high sheriff and very occasionally he will fulfil that role. The, the high sheriff is responsible for the day two proclamation should the monarch die. Um, but the role has ex expanded since old historic times and it's now about um, linking in with charities, um, supporting events like this and most high sheriffs have a theme of their own. My theme is supporting young children from challenged backgrounds. Um, the last couple of years have been really difficult for um, a number of young children and the charities I've chosen are Youth Challenge Oxfordshire, Children Heard and Seen, and active Oxfordshire and fundraising for those charities, but also trying to bring all the youth charities together at an event at the Wood Centre in September and very much promote their, the activities they're doing and, um, where possible, bring a number of business people, um, college leaders and others in as trustees and mentors for those charities. So if that infuses any of you, please do let me know. New homes for homeless people, new homes for young people, is something that society needs to provide, but also goes to the heart of the discussion we're going to have this afternoon in terms of how we provide those homes in an environmental, environmentally, ecologically friendly way. And there's no right answer about it, but it's wonderful to have such an array of people from the ecological sector the re real estate sector here today to discuss and debate that and hopefully form partnership. As well as being High Sheriff, 
I'm a big fan of the Earth Trust. Um, the, the Earth Trust very much sets the example for us um, and t walks the walk as well as talking the talk. And Jane, you're extremely persuasive in terms of the arguments you put forward, in large part because you acted out yourself. Um, my company, extremely proud to be in your construction partner for the construction of the Earth Lab and also to help fund your outreach programmes to East Oxford schools to bring young children to the countryside and show them a different way of life. I say to you, very much take on board what you hear this afternoon, debate, discuss what comes forward, but above all, enjoy the event. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, I'm, Ch I'm Jay Manley, I'm the Chief Executive. I'm very proud to be the Chief Executive of the Earth Trust. And I'm really delighted to have so many people here this afternoon from so many different sectors. I think it, um, I was telling um, anybody who would hear me that I haven't been to an event like this where so many different individuals across multiple sectors were coming together to have a dialogue. And I think, if nothing else, that's an achievement. But I wanted to start with our beautiful, amazing Earth. We have great knowledge, and with that knowledge comes huge responsibility. But we also know that we're in an Anthropocene. We know that the time that we live in now has be sh been shaped by us by humans for generations. So the challenges we're facing today have actually been shaped by us, and it's actually only us that's going to get us out of this mess. And we're faced with three important crises. I know you know this, but in order to set the scene for the discussion that we're about to have, I want to put them front and centre to the discussion. So the climate emergency, no longer can we bury our heads in the sand around the climate emergency. There is so much to do. Our climate is already changing and we're beginning to see the impacts of that change. And anything that we do now is actually trying to backcast for the impacts that we've had on this planet for the last 50 or 100 years. Ecological emergency. Ecological emergency has been um, there for the last 50, 60, 70 years. But we've now reached a real tipping point in terms of our crises, crises in terms of species and crises in terms of the habitats. And again, a lot of this is to do with what we have done as a society. And the health crisis. Um, I, I know you're aware of this, but we had this thing called COVID over the last couple of years. Um, and I think what happened during COVID, certainly what we saw at the Earth Trust, was that there was a real thirst for people to get out into the natural world, into the environment, into green spaces, e into open spaces and really enjoy them. And we, um, we wanted to make sure that our green spaces were open, the green spaces that in, are in our care. It was really important to us because we know that these green spaces for many are a natural health service. Um, I, I'm not going to read out what people, what we all ha absolutely have to do on this running track to get to that end. I hope you can see it. What I do want to draw your attention to is that this is all about people. It's people that are going to make a difference. It's people like you and I who are designing, constructing, building, influencing policy, influencing others, making decisions about your investments. It's people like you that are in the driving seat on whether we get from here to here. And it's also you in your, your uh, home lives in terms of what decisions you're making towards these three emergencies. So this for me, this for us, is about dialogue today, not um, debate. So debate is when you uh, pin each other up against the wall with the information that you want to give people. Today this is about dialogue. 
it's about sharing. It's about sharing what you think. It's about sharing what we know. It's about sharing what's really important to us. Because one thing's for certain, we definitely got to change what we've been doing in the past. And we've got to face up to this change and do things differently in the future. I've spoken to many of you over the last two or three months. I haven't spoken to all of you, and I apologize for those that I didn't reach out to. Um, but uh, I wanted to, as we were building this event, as we were identifying the conversation that we want to have with you, I wanted to understand different perspectives, different lenses. And these words kept coming to the fore as I was having these conversations. So vision, passion and partnerships. And I'm going to open these up to you now. But first, I want to do a little bit of challenging. I want to do a little bit of mindset change. So when we talk about communities, I think we talk about, well, I know we talk about, communities over here, human communities over here, and ecological communities over here. Now, one of the things we really seriously have to do is bring those communities together. They need to overlap as much as possible in everything we're doing, because if they don't, it's, we probably won't get to that end point that we need to get to. So thinking differently about communities is quite key. One thing's for certain is that people thrive in nature. I don't have to rehearse with you um, that people are happier, healthier, physically healthier, mentally healthier. But as a result of being connected with the environment, there's a greater propensity to actually um, deliver pro-environmental behaviours. But one thing that isn't particularly well understood is that communities that engage with nature together actually build greater bonds within that community. And what this leads to are stronger, more resilient communities. Communities with and individuals with greater skills and confidence. More confidence in the outdoors, more confidence in their lives. They've actually got more focus and get up and go, and hopefully that focus and get up and go is going to be around one of these emergencies and what they need to do better, what we all need to do better. Um, but what is quite interesting is that these communities that live in environments where they, there is a connection with the natural world, they actually, not only do they want to live in greener communities, they actually want to take part. So there's... There's a, a feedback loop there between nature and people and healthy communities. Um, I know we're talking a lot about the levelling up agenda and I just wanted to open up what the levelling up agenda means to us and this conversation. So we're talking about access and we're talking about engagement. Now, they, they are different things. They're connected, but they're different things. So, and I'm going to be a bit controversial here. So putting a footpath through a green space does give people access. What it doesn't do is necessarily engage people, facilitate the engagement, deep learning, deep understanding um, that we really want to achieve in order to reach that point where people are making the change happen. <coughs> Um, and even more controversially, if we put a signboard next to the access track, that wouldn't be ticking that box either. But we can discuss that. Um, partnerships. Uh, we've already used that word quite a lot. Um, I want to open it up for you in terms of how we've been approaching it, because I think what we've been doing has been quite different in this sector to others, but with real purpose. So going back five years ago, we had a vision. We had a need to have a skills and learning building, definitely a need for a skills and learning building. We have more than 5,000 school children that come through um, our doors every year pre-COVID. But we didn't just want to build a skills and learning building. We wanted to build something special, something that was going to give people, visitors, a vision into what a sustainable future could look like. I know, this is what Visions of the Earth Trust are all about. Um, and we were looking for people who would support that vision, who would enter into that vision and support it with us. And of course we needed people, Earth Trust has never got any money, so we needed people who could 
help that investment invest in where we wanted to get to in terms of our vision. And I'm absolutely delighted that um, Oxlep and also the Patsy Wood Trust were the first two um, <coughs> funding streams that actually got what we were talking about. And I know it was probably difficult. It was probably not a traditional project, but um, it's partners such as this that really embraced not just the end product, but the process. And it's the process in terms of this partnership that's really important. So once we got the funding, we were able then to go into design and construction. And again, this wasn't a traditional route because I don't know whether you realise, but Earth Trust isn't an expert at design and construction of skills and learning buildings. So we needed people who were experts, but we needed people who really got our vision, that really understood it, that would really go the extra mile. And I'm, I'm so pleased, Mark, Beard stepped into that space for us really well, as well as Agile, who did the design. And the partnership needs to be strong right from the very beginning because there are ups and downs. Why does everything cost more than you imagine it's going to be when you set out, for instance? But also the type of build that we were doing required huge translation from um, different methodologies, different construction, different forms of constructions and materials that we were constructing with. And we needed to work together because nobody knew the answer. And I'm re I am really delighted, this is why I'm spending so long <laughs> here telling you about how we have embarked in terms of our partnership and how we feel that's made a real difference to the end product. And I hope you've managed to go and have a look at Earth Lab and see the end product. But that is the end product. Um, I'm hoping that you will also um, get to understand at some point the process that we've gone through. Earth Trust is both a scientific, ecologically science organisation and a social science organisation. So we work with people and we work with ecological communities. And as a result, we question absolutely everything from lots of different angles. And today, what I'm going to be doing is set up, setting up a hypothesis for you and the discussion. Um, the panellists are aware of this and we're going to be um, entering into a dialogue around this hypothesis. And we want to challenge ourselves. So, and the question around this hypothesis is can we design, build and live for people and um, nature to thrive in balance? Can we? Um, and in order to explore that, in order to think about the lenses a little bit further, we need to create a new ecosystem. Remember the three crises? We need to, to uh, create a new ecosystem where we're talking about um, the same things we probably were, but in a different context. <laughs> So this enhanced ecosystem brings these needs together. And what we're talking about this afternoon is um, building communities, building developments in urban settings or semi-urban settings. And, and for us, what we the criticality points here are around understanding about what green infrastructure is and the terms that are used. And I know the terms are changing over time, but I just wanted to give you the three categories. This is how we talk about green infrastructure. We talk about biodiversity. We talk about an urban greening factor, so that's sustainable urban drainage systems, green roofs, and we talk about open, green open spaces or open spaces. So parks, gardens, um, allotments, community, food growing spaces. We have sent you quite a lot of information on the six principles, so I only intend to very, very quickly scoot through them. We've come up with these principles in order to get you to think and talk. We think um, we've reached the point where we can't really go any further with these six principles until you start talking to us and to one another about whether they're the right ones. So the discussion this afternoon is also going to be around, are these the right principles? But very quickly, I'm going to canter through them. So um, each of the panellists that's going to be talking and entering into conversation with you um, 
has uh, has an element of all six of these, sorry, one or more of these six principles. So accessible natural green space standards, that could be called green infrastructure. This is about spatial planning, spatial awareness in terms of where those green spaces are and how far from communities they are. And the closer they are to communities, the better it is for us all. Nature built into the structure of buildings. And there are two parts of this. There's providing homes for wildlife within construction. But the second point is about the element that I talked previously around, which is climate change. So we have to think about what we're building, what materials we're building, are we locking up carbon? So in this context, we're talking about can we embed nature in order to address those crises? Green landscaping for climate, nature and health and well-being. So here we're thinking about what would a normal development have to do to succeed in terms of its infrastructure? And can we convert those elements, can we green those elements and make them better for the environment and better for people? Um, I hope you've done the tour and I hope you've been able to um, uh, hear about Earth Adventure. Play, leisure, engagement in green spaces is really critical and different people engage with nature in different ways. What Earth Adventure does is it offers a stepping stone opportunity for those who probably wouldn't want to go for a walk, for instance, in the outdoors as they're the first thing they want to do when they get up in the morning. Um, and we have to think also about our food and where it comes from and whether communities can grow that food in, able, in order to establish that connection that we are so needing. The fifth one is around, um, we've called it modelling green spaces for sustainability and there are different parts of this. So there's, if we're putting in green spaces, we've got to think about their construction, we've got to think about how they operate, and we've got to think about how they're maintained. And we've got to think about and plan for where the money's going to come from to put those, to put all that in place. Because we fail if we can't do all three of those. So what we'll be talking about, what we've already started talking about, is habitat banking, isn't it? We've, we, we've got a massive conversation going on around biodiversity net gain, carbon offsets, etc. So again, we'll be opening up that this afternoon in the conversation. And the sixth one, which is probably the one that sits right at the centre of the other five, is putting people at the heart of developments. And play back where I started, it's people who are going to make a difference. We really do have to focus on people, their needs, how they're accessing the natural world, how they're engaging with the natural world, what opportunities do we need to provide. And again, that will be opened up for you later. In order to test the hypothesis, I've got three high-level questions. Matthew's looking quizzical. I hope he knows that my three high-level questions. So, are these the right principles? Very happy for you to argue about dialogue, about whether they're the right principles and how we might change them in future. Do we need place and people-based master plans? Because from what I see and I experience, they are quite different things in people's minds and they tend not to overlap them in the overall master planning. And how can we make planning and policy work better for us, knowing where we want to get to? So roll back what you told me through the conversations. You talked a lot about vision. My question is whether we can whether we can have one vision or do we have to have multiple visions or if we do have multiple visions then how do they add up to one vision? How can you um, embrace the passion that there is within your organisations towards this vision and really get us moving as a society? And partnerships. So, are, do we have the right people in the room, for instance, today? When you're doing pieces of work, do you think that 
you have the right people sitting around the table that can help and guide from all the different lenses and aspects that I've been talking about. Because what we're needing to do is to build something really special for the future, otherwise we are not going to be able to address the crises we face. Thank you. Right, so could the panel come up, please? I just want to say, Jane is keen. This is a partnership, so we need some feedback. It'd be great to hear, um, you know, when you feel comfortable, put up your hand for Q&A. But it'd be great to hear examples Yes, we can be rhetorical and question what we're about to hear, but it'd be also great to hear something constructive about, you know, examples about where some of these issues are actually put in place. So I'll look forward to hearing that later, won't I? Yes, good, well done. Listening at the back there. So it'd be good, be good to get that interaction. Right, let's go, let's go from far left. Gita, do you just want to explain your name and where you come from? educator and I also run a registered social enterprise called Dudley Ma CIC which means grandmothers I'm not a grandmother but I could get a phone call any minute that I will become one <laughs> <laughs> very good okay and I'm uh, Ben Gardner from Ecology by Design uh, also from another company Civity so essentially ecology consultancy and the other one is to do with biodiversity offsetting great thanks very much uh, Rachel uh, hi, I'm Rachel Sankis. I'm the director of a charity based in Oxford, working nationally called the Centre for Sustainable Healthcare. <coughs> Great. So we work, we work to help the NHS and the rest of healthcare to become more sustainable. Brilliant. Peter? Uh, my name's Peter Massini. I'm a freelance consultant. I deal with issues around ecology and green infrastructure. Uh, I used to work in London a lot, and I'll explain a bit more about that later on. Okay, good. Exciting. London. Brilliant. Julia? <laughs> work at the Town and Country Planning Association, which is a charity which has a vision for homes, places and communities where everyone can thrive. And we work to influence the planning system and one of the things we do is run something called the Green Infrastructure Partnership, which promotes better green infrastructure. And it's free to join. Okay, brilliant. And J Jane? Hello, Jane Houghton. I work at Natural England, based in London. Um, and I'm project managing the Green Infrastructure Framework, Principles and Standards for England, a project that's in development, um, and I lead on local nature reserves. Thank you. Excellent. Can you hear, hear Jane at the back? Yeah, okay, great. Okay, Jane, do you want to lead then? Yeah. Um, and, and we've asked them to do a short uh, presentation um, with one slide, um, and, and then we'll, we'll go to a Q&A uh, across the panel afterwards. Jane, over to you. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here. It's great to see so many people. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Um, so I'd just like to say a little bit about the Green Infrastructure Framework. Um, Jane um, has described the importance of building nature in for the key benefits that it can deliver, uh, climate, nature recovery, and health and well-being. And Natural England has a day-to-day -day role in building nature in um, as part of our planning role but we're also working really hard to develop the Green Infrastructure Framework, um, which are, uh, is a commitment in the 25-year environment plan, and we're working closely with DEFRA and stakeholders, um, including, yes, with the Green Infrastructure Partnership. Um, so, uh, Jane's kindly de described and defined green infrastructure, and our aim is to improve existing green infrastructure across England, um, to create more GI, uh, to provide all the benefits that we've mentioned. And we want the framework to really help to, um, the country to recover from COVID-19 by ensuring everyone has access to good quality GI and focusing provision, especially in areas of multiple deprivation and health inequalities where there can often be low quality GI. And we want to support local authorities in using the GI framework to refresh local plans and they need to be refreshed by 2023. But we ought to really mainstream GI. So it's a key asset in place making and place keeping. So um, 
we're working to develop a framework that will really help stakeholders to focus initially on areas where we know there isn't enough good quality accessible green infrastructure. And we want to ensure that new developments include GI and that any area that has little or no green space can be improved for the benefit of the com community. And in developing the framework, um, we're aiming to help local planning authorities and developers meet requirements in the national planning policy framework to consider GI in local plans and in new development. And there's also the potential for the framework to help local areas develop their local access targets as set out in the levelling up white paper. And the, the new levelling up and regeneration bill that was recently announced includes a requirement for local areas to develop their own local design codes and fortuitously we're developing a GI design guide that will help local authorities develop these design codes and incorporate GI. Um, but we're also developing the framework for other organisations such as parks and green space managers and local communities to really think more about GI and how it can meet local needs. So to develop the framework, we found out what local authorities, developers and other stakeholders think are, um, is really important. And this has clarified the main barriers to planning. And we've also tested the framework with local authorities such as Oxfordshire County Council, and that has been really useful. So we're aiming to provide clarity about what good GI looks like and how to plan it strategically. So we've developed 15 principles of good GI, and they're very much um, match and, and are, are in synergy with Jane's Earth Trust principles. Um, we're also developing the design guide, as I said, and process guides, you know, how to do GI. And we've developed and made available a mapping database tool uh, to provide evidence freely, publicly accessible, with analyses overlaid with uh, social economic data, um, and we'll be adding more to that database. And we're helping to create a level playing field uh, for development by uh, developing GI standards. So updating the accessible natural green space standards that Jane mentioned, developing an urban greening factor. And we're encouraging local authorities to set their own targets. So particularly, for example, around uh, tr urban tree canopy cover. Um, and we want to help break down silos between the different sectors, very much as this event is doing highlighting how collaboration and partnership working can deliver these multiple benefits and help unlock funding. Um, and we're clarifying the relationship between GI and biodiversity net gain, how they can help each other, providing information about new funding opportunities. Uh, so there's, for example, a new nine million uh, pot from um, the uh, DLUC uh, for the levelling up parks fund, which will help to deliver 100 green spaces where they're most needed. And of course, there will be local nature recovery strategies and their priorities will help to inform green infrastructure strategies and vice versa, and also bring in new funding. So we're going to launch this uh, framework this coming December. Uh, we really want to create a buzz to promote the key messages around building nature in. And we're working with stakeholders on a range of options for announcements, webinars and publications at around the same time. And perhaps we could see this event as the very first of those. So thank you very much for watching this space. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. That's, that's very exciting, and it's great that, that this can be seen as the, the first of that, or, or part of that launch. Um, right, Julia, do you mind, there's a request, could you stand up? Yes, of course. I don't know if it's just you, I think it's all of you. <laughs> right. Mm. Um, so it's just so that they can see you at the back. Uh, I, think, I think they've got half, 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 half of seeing okay. something. That's great. And I think there's going to be a slide. Uh, brilliant. Thank you. Wonderful. Uh, so, a few weeks ago, I was lucky enough to go to Cornwall to see some green infrastructure projects that had had some funding. And um, we went and saw a range of innovative projects, including two primary schools that had been given a small amount of money to green their playgrounds. Both of the schools and what they'd done were really inspiring. One of them had made very good progress in greening the playground. They'd added a green wall and planters and a pond and some other features in what was otherwise a very hard, tarmac-y sort of space. 
and the kids loved it, and the teacher said that the greening had helped improve the behaviour of the kids in the playground. The other school, however, had gone much further. They'd built nature into everything that they did. This picture is of a polytunnel that is one of their classrooms. Nature was embedded into all of their lessons. <coughs> Outside all of the classrooms, there were uh, boot racks with muddy boots from the kids. They were out and about, they were in nature, they were building dens in the playground. And they'd used their bit of funding not only to green their playground, but to transform the way they teach and to build nature into everything they did. And this was a school where instead of having a cake sale to raise money, they sold the vegetables that the kids had been growing in the school grounds. It was really, really um, fantastic to see that. And what I'd like to think about is the big transformation we need to get from <coughs> putting nature around the edges of things to really building nature into everything we do. In England, our current planning policies are, from an environmental perspective, gradually moving in the right direction, and initiatives such as biodiversity net gain will make a difference. But our planning policy still adds nature in around the edges. It still puts buildings and roads and structures first, and then nature is fitted in around what's left over. Last week, government announced a new levelling up and regeneration bill, as Jane has just mentioned, and that includes significant reforms to the planning system. And while there are things to welcome in the bill, it doesn't represent the radical transformation of planning policy that the country so urgently needs. Planning policy, planning policy should start with a very clear statement. The very first sentence should say that the purpose of planning is to um, support the health of the planet and support the health of the people who live on the planet. At the moment, planning is sometimes described as a process without a purpose. And we at the PTPA think it should have a very clear purpose about the well-being of the planet and the well-being of people. England urgently needs planning policy that builds nature in rather than tries to add it round the edges. So at the TCPA, where I work, we support the six pillars that Jane mentioned earlier of the Building in Nature In project. And we will continue to campaign for a national planning policy that puts the health of the planet and the health of people right at the heart of everything it aims to achieve. And we hope that you'll support us to do this. Thank you. Okay, Peter, please. Hi. Over to you. Um, I'm just going to give you a few reflections based on uh, the work I've been doing over the last 30 years now. Um, I mentioned that uh, um, I worked in London. So I, I worked in London for about 25 years as, as an ecologist. And I went there originally uh, to work for the London Wildlife Trust, um, having, done, having done a rural environment studies course, fondly thinking I'd be managing a nature reserve in Norfolk, but ended up in, in, in London and staying there because it was fascinating. It was fascinating doing nature conservation in London. And that's really sort of a guided my career over the last 30 years, but beginning to realise what, what does it actually mean to do nature in a city, and nature in places where people live and work, uh, and, and the conflicts that arise there in terms of nature and people, development and nature and ecology. Um, when I was a kid, um, I, used to, I, mean, I, I was born, born and brought up in rural Sussex, and I, I live in rural Sussex now, and um, when I was a kid, I used to hear cuckoos every May. Every May you hear cuckoos. It, it was like a background noise. Except this year, I've not heard a cuckoo this year. And that speaks to some of the things that Jane was saying about the ecological crisis. You know, the fact that you know, I live in rural Sussex and haven't heard a cuckoo. But when I went to London, I realised that actually most people never heard a cuckoo. And it's not because I don't care about cuckoos. It's just like there are no cuckoos in London. There are no cuckoos in the middle of Oxford or the middle of Maidstone or the middle of Scunthorpe. So if we want to build nature in, we've got to think about what does that mean? What does nature mean in terms of the relevance of people's lives? So in my career, I've moved very much from being... I'm, I'm at heart, I'm still an ecologist and a nature conservationist. But my whole career has been about how we actually integrate the, the benefits that nature can provide into a city. Because you know, cities and natures are, in some ways, diametrically opposed. You know, we need places to live. We need places to work. And London's got not 9 million people, you know. 
there's, there's, there's a basic laws of physics in terms of space, you know, in terms of screen space, space, nature, and people. But we need to think differently about how we actually create places which build nature in, into urban developments that primarily start from what does nature provide for us? So thinking about the impacts of climate change and thinking about things like sustainable drainage, how you cool the urban environment in ways using nature-based solutions. And that's not about thinking primarily about particular bits of ecology. It's thinking about how you design systems that benefit people, which can also have a benefit of nature. Try and think it through that way. Uh, because cities are people. They're people, they're buildings, they're structures. Um, that they're not natural environments. We also use nature recovery in the wider environment. I'm not saying we shouldn't do nature recovery, but when we're talking about development, uh, green infrastructure, uh, nature-based solutions, is about making that nature, that green infrastructure, relevant to people. Because that's what makes it become something which is required rather than just an, an aesthetic um, backdrop to people's lives. Something that actually means something to people on a, on a daily basis. Uh, that actually makes their lives happier and healthier and better places to live. So we need to think collaboratively around between architects, landscape architects, ecologists, infrastructure engineers. The, the most important person is a transport engineer. Now, I've known a huge amount designing in cities around the needs of bin lorries. You know, we need to understand how a bin lorry gets around the development. It's critical. You know, it's, it's, it's an essential requirement. But if you start thinking about those things in an integrated way you can actually create designs and solutions that meet a whole range of requir requirements. It's not easy, and there will be trade-offs, but without those discussions, you end up with projects that don't really work very well at all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Rachel. Right, uh, very, very different probably. Um, but I was so I was gonna I was gonna talk a little bit about what we do um, as a group. But I was gonna start by saying one of the one of the things that connected me, I think, to the environment when I was really young was that I started getting eczema and hay fever before everybody had hay fever, um, and so I became very aware of chemicals in the built environment and in the stuff I was using, the shampoos and all of that stuff. So. Uh, driven by a need, a sort of personal need and personal illness, really, I was, from the age of seven or eight on, I was looking at the labels of things and, and interested in, um, in the environment. And I suppose, for me, that's stayed with me. So that connection between health and the environment and what we are doing to ourselves is, has been part of my life ever since then. Um, and, and really what we're trying to do with my uh, organisation is to bring the message of connecting health and the environment to, uh, to healthcare professionals in particular, but also to everyone else who uses the health system. Because they are powerful voices, um, they are trusted, and they have a, a big voice in, in the wider community. So you all know, have known for a long time, and people in the natural environment sector have known for a long time that, that uh, nature needs our, our re-attention or our help, or maybe just to be ignored for a bit. Um, but also, um, bringing, we know that bringing that in and making it part of our current lives is not necessarily easy. Um, so one of the first things that we did was to start something called the NHS Forest. And that was a very simple way of saying NHS, health, forest, nature, bring them together. We didn't necessarily know what that would turn into, um, but it was a way of making a connection. And uh, it started off by saying, OK, we'll plant some trees, because a tree is a symbol of, the, of nature, of the natural environment. And planting trees on hospital grounds, where they're visible and where people can uh, make that connection. So it was a kind of Trojan horse, in a way, to get ideas in, our foot in the door. Um, but it's grown very much into a really uh, kind of varied project with a lot of different aspects. Um, and I think one of the things, in terms of making change on the ground, and obviously, you know, the health, I don't know how many of you have worked in the health service, but it's a very slow place to change. They're dealing with emergencies and things all the time. They're dealing with a lot of issues, obviously, and so they have limited capacity for um, other stuff. But over the last few years, it's become really, really obvious that, uh, that this connection is there, and COVID has really helped, I think, people to stand back and think and, and um, re-engage with nature, as Jane was saying, but also 
just come out of gear a little bit and think what do we want as people for our own health and our own um, well-being. And that's meant that, um, that concepts like the NHS Forest have, have really, really grown and they have, um, I don't know, taken on a life of their own in, in some ways so that you have lots of different things developing all over the place. It's definitely not just tree planting anymore. Um, and one of those things that we've, one of the things that we've done is to start a nature ranger program because we <coughs> realise that to get busy people and patients and other people engaged, you need somebody, you need a resource, and that is not just a thing or a building, it's people. So um, a nature ranger is based on an NHS site, um, but they are doing, they are an ecologist by background and they are doing that nature connection. So um, there are five nature rangers now in different places around the country, um, and uh, we hope to spread that, that model. But this building here, which is Alder Hay, um, is a children's hospital. I don't know if you could, can you all see it? Um, and uh, a little bit like the beautiful building you've seen before, it was designed to uh, fit into the natural landscape. It was actually built into a park. Um, so it's a children's hospital. And one of the crucial things was that they did a lot of consultation with patients, and in particular with children. So the design is um, co-designed, really, with the users of the building. And I think that's made a huge difference to actually how it's come out and how it will be used. Um, so this is to show that this is, you know, it's not just a thing that can be done on a small scale, as I'm sure a lot of you are aware, but it can, we can have buildings like this on a much larger scale. Um, and hospitals are one way of doing that. Obviously, most of the buildings that we have in the NHS are not going to be built from new, so we, we have to also think about retrofitting, but this is just to say that when we are building from new, there's a huge possibility. When we're retrofitting, there's also lots we can do in terms of suds and so on, but, um, but uh, yes, in terms of how we integrate nature into health, we are talking um, very much, as Julia said, not about just adding it on. So we're not just redesigning the grounds, but we're trying to integrate use of nature into how the health system works. So we've, we're thinking about how we take rehabilitation, for example, at a hospital site and create a walkway so that people can practice steps, have benches, have ramps, have uh, that, that will help their bodies get back to health. Um, and uh, use that natural environment very much as part of health and get people to see those connections in terms of their everyday uh, work, both as staff and as patients. I think I shut up now. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. <laughs> uh, uh, just, just very quick, just very quick, whereabouts is Old Alder Hay again? Okay. Sorry, Liverpool. Liverpool, I yeah. think so. Okay, Liverpool. Excellent. Yeah. Right, okay, so Ben. Yep. Over to you. So hello all. So um, I guess I'm probably quite different to the rest of the panellists. Um, so first and foremost, I'm an ecology consultant, so I guess I, my role is really to aid developers getting planning permission on the most part. Um, so you could say I work for the dark side rather than the light, I guess. But um, really what I'm going to talk about in these very, very quick four minutes is mostly around biodiversity offsetting, biodiversity net gain. So. Um, I mean, really, to make this building nature in, we need to make sure that the landscape and the wildlife that we work in and are involved in um, is, is something that's enjoyed by all. All stakeholders are involved. Everyone participates. Everyone gets involved. So, um, I mean, earlier this week, I'm, I'm big into social media. So earlier this week, I saw a, a graphic that was put up by a, a, an organization called Barton Wilmore. Um, and it essentially, it showed the whole of England um, uh, and what it showed on there was the areas impacted by uh, nitrate neutrality uh, uh, and then also impacted by uh, essentially green belt issues. And that pretty much covered almost the entire of England. So it caused huge problems for all those people involved in it. And now we have what's been um, sort of, well, I'll say it, thrown together, thrown out there in the biodiversity net gain agenda. Uh, and everyone's kind of tried to find their way, find, pick up the pieces and try and make it work for everyone involved. Um, but I think it really gives us a great opportunity, actually. Um, so I've been brought here to talk largely about Biodiversity Again, Biodiversity Agenda, uh, and the funding elements that this can bring. 
So it does give us a massive opportunity. Um, so I'm talking about modeling green spaces for sustainability. Um, the biodiversity net gain, offsetting, habitat banking all play a huge part in this. But biodiversity net gain isn't going far enough. Really what we should be talking about is, is environmental net gain, or let's take it even further than that and not talk about biodiversity or environmental, and actually talk about mutual net gain or just net gain. Net gain for everybody involved, all stakeholders, not just the ecologists in the room, which are probably many, but also the developers in the room, the planners in the room, everyone involved in property. Um, so for me, over the last couple of years, obviously we've all had a very hard time with everything that's gone on, but it's been really, really important to be connected with all those green spaces, whether that was in the urban environment or in the rural environment. I live a stone's throw from here, five minutes down the road, so the Earth Trust was really important to me to come out with my family and get that, uh, the benefits that that can bring. Um, the image you can see just here, this isn't my children, but it could quite easily be. We would regularly end up up on, the, up on here, up on the clumps, which is just behind us. Um, they would be regularly filthy like that, jumping in the Thames when it wasn't full of sewage, um, having lots and lots of fun doing these sorts of things. It's really important we take these kind of people along with us. Um, I mentioned stakeholders. So we need to recognize the natural capital that things like biodiversity net gain biodiversity that we do on sites like this, um, for, uh, uh, and essentially the benefits that these kind of things can bring, so offsetting what they can bring. Uh, we need to get these pots of money together, use them strategically, um, and use them at a large scale, as big as we can possibly go, as ambitious as we possibly can, um, but not forgetting what we're already doing in a small area, in small environments, but go big wherever we, wherever we possibly can. I read a recent article actually as well that um, one in three people currently don't have adequate access to green space. So where I mentioned about coming up here to the clumps, I'm lucky, I have access to it, lots of people don't. So wherever we possibly can, bringing those benefits, the funding, the pools of cash, the pools of expertise together to bring these large scale habitat banking or biodiversity offsetting projects, but also bringing them into the urban environment will be beneficial to all. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I guess, I'm challenging everybody here um, to kind of get involved in this conversation and try and look at biodiversity state gain, not as kind of an evil word, but actually try and take it further. Let's try and do more. Let's be ambitious. Let's go environmental. Let's just go for net gain overall. I expect that's four minutes. Yeah, excellent. Very good. <laughs> okay. Last leg, Gita. Right, I've got <coughs> this mic here, so shall I just hold it like this? That'll be all right, just burn it down every time. We'll, we'll put it on the seat. All right. Okay, so my name's Geeta, and I suppose my story into connecting with nature is through childhood intergenerational trauma, where nature has helped me to heal, and more recently, probably over the last seven, eight years, is menopause trauma. But in four minutes, I've chosen to share reflections based on community moments of joy and trauma as a South Asian woman of colour who is now a walk leader. I'm a woman over 40 with two grown up daughters, and like I said, about to become a grandmother any minute. So just awaiting the news. Um, I'm someone who's leading a gentle revolution in green spaces. I never thought of myself as a revolutionist, but somebody called at me and I kind of embraced it. I embody the stories of my community in relation to nature connections experienced through faith, spirituality, religion, race, and gender, ancestral cultural knowledge and philosophies, folk stories, and Ayurvedic healing. Walking in nature with diverse communities of color, I've managed to open up a safe space to bring nature in through the ancient art form of storytelling, a valuable form of human connection. So the first point I want to touch on is diverse lenses of nature connection. And Jane has already touched on this in the opening presentation. So I want to encourage you, me, all of us as organizations and individuals to critically question and unpick the hierarchy of connecting with nature experiences. Just like the class system, in India the caste system, there is a hierarchy. When I entered this space a couple of years ago, I felt like I was at the bottom of the class 
the girl with the grade D, because of the nature of experiences that I had, or rather lack of. I still do today, and I still did when I entered the space here today. I felt like the other who was being gazed at. I didn't see people or stories like mine being celebrated or valued, so I chose to hide them. I wasn't sciencey enough. I then chose to embark on a journey to change the narrative of green spaces through my narrative as a woman of colour. I saw people like David Attenborough, and quite rightly, at the top of the tree, alongside mainly white nature writers. The nature experiences of black indigenous people of colour or women like me were represented as lacking knowledge or felt colonised and inauthentic. So I found ways to seek out the nature stories and nurture them of people that connected with my ancestral history and the ancestral history of my great grandmothers. In my academic journey, I've read mainly educational books, but this has been a new educational journey for me. I felt inspired then when I started to find Indian feminist scholars like Vandana Shiva, an Indian environmentalist who connects to the soil in powerful ways. She examines the position of women in relation, in relation to nature and colonization. Also powerful people like Satish Kumar. So I started at the bottom of the class, the girl with the grade D a couple of years ago, and I've learned to navigate this space. And I've noticed that as I navigate this space, I bring my diverse lens of bringing nature in, and it's just as valuable, even though it may feel invisible. The second point, genuine actions beyond lip service, inclusion and diversity partnerships. As I've learned to navigate the nature space, I question whose voices and stories are heard and centered and whose stories are being amplified in this space. How are voices on nature being captured? How do the power dynamics and politics play out in designing, connecting people with nature spaces? Who's partnering with who? Almost like who's getting into bed with who and why? And what, who's willing to give up their power in doing so? Are we paying lip service to tokenistic equality, diversity and inclusion agendas? Or are we genuinely listening and engaging and acting? And by genuine, I mean it's more than a diverse bank of people of colour in nature. It's moving beyond that and actually understanding their cultural stories. The meta-language of nature, well, it's complicated, it baffled me. It's one of the reasons I was petrified of coming here today. As a teacher educator, I've taught lectures on grammar. I'm very aware of how language carries power. Teaching in a university like Brunel, I attract mainly South Asian student teachers from West London. Many of them have had no experience of grammar teaching when they come to me. So the meta-language of nature felt just like that to me. The adverbial phrases, prepositional phrases, all of that. Anyway, this lens has made me reflect on the space and nature meta-language and how it includes and excludes some. So if we're talking about deep connections in and with and through nature, we need to move beyond just thinking about complex terms and scientific knowledge. Of course, it's important. We need that meta-language and we know it's, it equips us powerfully. However, in my community work, that's not my starting point. It's always the emotional and the psychological connection with nature. Health and well-being. There are so many shades of meaning when we think of health and well-being. The health and well-being market is suffocated through a commercial lens. It is saturated and there's a dearth of research on green prescriptions and nature benefits. So I encourage you to question whose lens are these health and nature benefits written through and presented through. Health and well-being means different things to different people. When I grew up, Health and well-being, if I said that to my mum or dad, they would have laughed and ridiculed. Okay, it was about survival, not thrival in nature. 
So I talk, I listen to different people when they come and walk with me, often for the first time in the Chilterns countryside. Being a British-born South Asian woman of colour, a first-generation working-class migrant who faced racism, my lived experiences of health and well-being in relation to nature are constructed very differently, and therefore the way I hear other people's stories are also different. My final words. So how deep do you want to go? Are you willing to get uncomfortable? How can we build nature in through deep actions guided by a moral compass? One that is motivated by a genuine desire to care for the earth. When the right people are leading nature spaces, they will ask the right questions. They will reach out through deep cultural knowledge and research which is led through a decolonizing lens. We are more likely to find authentic ways to build nature in. We are not hard to reach. The institutions are hard. We are not hard. We have to be willing to get uncomfortable, uneasy, give up our privilege and power, decenter those traditional dominant narratives of how people and nature connect. So I end with Satish Kumar's words and I've read this book several times. I went to his lecture many years ago in Oxford, um, probably about 12 years ago. I didn't really get it at the time, but I've come back to it the last few years. If it's a book that you don't have on your bookshelf, I definitely recommend it. And it's called, he talks about the holy trinity of soil, soul, and society. And I reread the book this morning. I don't sleep very much, um, but I reread it this morning. Um, and in this book, he talks about the motivations. He talks about Mahatma Gandhi, Tagore, poetry. What are the motivations behind the actions that we take in this nature space? The motivation behind our actions determines the quality of our actions. So if you are in the nature space, in this space here today for power, fame, or money, it's the politics of materialism, he argues, and pride. I also say it's a battle of the egos then. If our politics is guided by service to the community in a way that's not we are giving you nature, so you are the poor people and we're giving it to you, no, it is you already understand nature, but you have a different way of understanding it. So if our politics is guided by service to the community, society, care for the earth and nature, then our politics become spiritual. I never thought of politics as spiritual, but I really like, hope Boris Johnson reads that, so I might have said <laughs> that to him. Anyway, as somebody who works in education, I really connect with Satish Kumar's three H's for a sustainable future. He says, we need to replace the three R's of reading, writing, and arithmetic with the three H's guided by, now if someone comes up with the three, you've got the book, and it's a signed <laughs> copy. <laughs> so the first person to come up with the three gets the book. <laughs> the three H's of? Health, 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 health happiness. happiness. Heart. Heart is one. Who can come up with the other two? Hope. No, it's a good one. Hope. Nobody gets the book. It'll be the most interesting conversation I have after. Okay, the three H's are guided by the head, heart, and the hand. So I end my little presentation by saying that's how I, at Dudley Mars, a becoming grandmother, hope to build deep connections and bring nature in with diverse communities. We are not hard to reach. If I might say that uh, seven, including Jane's, very powerful stories, and I use the word stories because some of it was very personal, and I think that's uh, uh, it, it perhaps reflects some of the issues we face today. So, um, just very quickly, while the uh, panel gather their thoughts and their and their energies, um, I just wanted to ask um, Nigel. Uh, is Nigel around? Nigel Tipple. Nigel Tipple is um, chief executive officer of the LEP and kind of integral to. Uh, some of the um, uh, partnering 
and, and the funding for this, this uh, facility. And I just wanted to get your initial reaction, obviously, to the seven stories, if we include James as well, and, and also perhaps some of the reasoning why Oxlep have been such a, a key partner for this great um, facility. Okay, thank you. Um, presume you can hear me. If not, I'll just shout because I'm pretty loud anyway. Um, I, I guess three things I wanted to just reflect on. Um, for those who know me, I don't really do scripts. I just a couple of headings and that's about me doing. Um, but, but in broad terms, I wrote down three things as I was listening. One was partnership. One was in investment, and that's not just about money, that's investment in time, commitment, and, and people. Um, and the other one is outcomes, not outputs. Um, now, in my world, outputs are everything. Um, it's what determines whether or not you're going to get some funding. It's what determines whether or not government will accept a particular set of arguments. But actually, what we focus on are outcomes. It's the things that result from the investment that's made, whether that's in people or, or money. Um, so I guess the, the, the starting point of that was partnership. Um, a number of years ago now, working with Jane and many others in this room, um, Sarah, one of my uh, colleagues, um, started to look at a project that was perhaps a little bit different. Um, it wasn't the traditional build. It wasn't the traditional project that fit all the standard boxes that we have to deal with in terms of government funding streams. But actually, it was a project that was going to make a difference. Um, it was going to make a difference, not just the physical build of it. And you've seen, for those who've had the benefit of going around the technology, um, my colleague here at the side of me, um, in, in terms of big construction and others, um, been able to use different technologies, bring those together with the advice and the capability of the team that Jane pulled together. Um, so partnership was very different in that context. It wasn't just a funder, an intermediary, and a project sponsor. It was actually a, a journey that we all had to go on and to work out why things were quite so expensive and how do we respond to change in need and how do we reflect some of those external factors like COVID, like EU exit, for instance, that had a material difference in the way that we had to deliver this scheme and many others. So partnership was first and foremost the priority, working together, doing things slightly differently, convincing others, particularly government, that this was the right thing to invest in. Um, my board had no problem with it. The team had no problem with it. We just had to make sure that government understood that their box of tricks in terms of funding parameters could be bent ever so slightly to still meet the same objectives. Second one around investment. Um, we invested a lot of time, a lot of people resource, as well as a lot of money. There's one and a half million just short of uh, what was local growth fund. For those who know the, the local government landscape, uh, and central government landscape, that funding was traditionally there to, to, you know, to build the buildings that were going to drive new jobs, new employment and innovation. What this investment, particularly in Earth Lab, but the, the refurbishments as well, has done is it's created a space within which we can start to look at what the outcomes will be long term for our future generations, for those dinosaurs like me who have grown up in a different world, um, and, and starting to experience what... Um, opportunities there are to retrofit. And I just reflected earlier, talking to, to Jane actually, um, another Jane, there's several Janes in the room so don't get confused, um, around pester power of kids and recycling. I can remember that when my kids were really young. Um, so instead of pestering for chocolate bars at the, you know, the supermarket counter, it was about what you're going to do with that plastic bottle and have you washed that one out and can we recycle this piece of cardboard and where do these newspapers go now? We've moved on a long way, we need to remember that, but actually it's another journey. It's actually taking it to an embedded society, which is what you were just saying in terms of how we respond uh, to that change. So really significant investment, a landmark building that we can all be proud of, um, but we can use it actually to leverage more government interest. The more government interest we get, the more likely we are to convince them that that kind of investment is the right thing. Um, and I guess finally for me is that outcomes point. It, you know, we've got a brilliant building out there, We've got an incredible showcase in terms of infrastructure and capability, but it's what goes on inside. It's the people and it's the actions and it's the activities that are going to make a difference. So that's probably enough from me. Hopefully I've covered everything you wanted, Jane. Um, and uh, uh, hopefully with questions that you've had a chance now to, to form in your heads, we can have a good uh, debate with the panel. Thank you. Thanks very much, Marvin. Um, right. What I'm going to do is, is pick up on, on a couple of issues, uh, issues for the wrong word, but themes um, which have come out throughout the 
panel discussion, and, and actually Nigel um, referenced one there, and this term partnership, it's, it's in danger of being hackneyed in the sense that it's used liberally. Um, but what does it really mean? And it seems to me, in pursuit of what we're trying to do this afternoon, partnering is, is a key component. And I just, I just wonder, do we really get it? And I, I'm just wondering, Gita, from your point of view, just look at this concept of partnering. How do you, what, what do you feel needs to be done to, to, to get partnering happening to, 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 to achieve some of the goals we've talked about today? I think we need to look at the power and the privilege that different partners hold and break those up and get uncomfortable. It's like getting a jigsaw piece and just shattering it and just thinking, right, how are we going to put that jigsaw back together and looking at the different areas of the community that we reflect in that, in that piece. And because unless we have representative, reflective people of society, we are not going to have genuine partnerships. End of. Very interesting. Peter, you've worked for many years in London, um, and you're bringing that kind of cross-section of views into your work now. What's your view about partnering? Uh, I, I think or, you, or you, the you, need for partnerships. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you, you touched it on your introduction about partnership becoming a bit of a hack, hackney phrase now. Um, because you've got partnerships with different purposes. I mean, you put a partnership to get a building built is a different partnership than the partnership that's put together to, to bring together communities to think about what they want from their communities. So I think we use the term partnership a bit too glibly rather than actually define what's the partnership for. Because sometimes a, a very tightly defined par partnership with a particular uh, purpose in mind is perfectly fine. But uh, if it's about coming up with a vision or a strategy or, or a or a proposition, you actually need to bring together now a much wider range of, of viewpoints and stakeholders to have that discussion. That's a, that's a conversation to reach a decision rather than a, a partnership with a specific purpose. So it, it does go back to the point about you know, the use of language. I mean, we, we use language. Um, uh, uh, I, I was a policymaker for a long time, so I know this. You know, you use language uh, um, to confuse sometimes rather than to actually uh, enlighten. Uh, sometimes, sometimes purposefully, because actually you don't want to be, have policy to be too prescriptive, mm. um, but you need to be careful you don't actually go too far that it becomes um, yeah, obfuscatory. Okay, that's really nice interesting. Balance, uh, somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, Jane, in, in your role at Nature England, I would have thought partnerships is kind of integral, really. Is that... Is that true, and how do you go about it? Um, yes, partnerships absolutely critical. Um, the the new concept of the nature recovery network um, is being led by partnerships, and they've got geographical bases. Um, so there are uh, the local nature partnerships for different counties, um, and then uh, and in those nature partnerships, we try to um, engage a very broad range of people across sector. Uh, from business to health, um, the environment, young people, and so on. So trying to be representative um, in those partnerships so that society is reflected in their decision-making um, and their points of view. Um, and so within the GI framework, we've got, you know, we start with partnership and we start with joint visioning. Um, and... Uh, interestingly, next week we've got a, a whole two-hour training session on partnership working, you know, how <coughs> to do it well and what that involves. Okay, that's really interesting. <laughs> Just a general question, um, Rachel, do you, do, Rachel, do you think post-COVID there's a different atmosphere? Um, I partly think that because you were involved in the hospital um, um, or, or you mentioned older, all the hay. Is there a different atmosphere since we've come out of the pandemic towards partnerships or is I being a bit... Um, a bit sort of misty-eyed. <laughs> um, uh, par well, partnerships in, obviously, healthcare have always, have always been there. Um, there have been various attempts at different, so different ways of, of cutting, you know, the matrix of partnerships, if you like, over the years. So the, the most recent thing is called the integrated care system. And that is a system. So this is for some of you who might be working at kind of, uh, that it's, it tends to be about 2 million population level 
So there are 42 ICE integrated care systems within the health service now across the country. And these are the latest attempt to get healthcare working across different organisations. So that is a deliberate partnership thing. That has not definitely not come out of um, COVID. I think the overriding thing still for the health sector really with COVID is that they're even more stressed. Lots of staff are off sick as well, long-term sickness and things like that. So it's really difficult getting things done. Um, but, you know, okay. people are willing. People yeah, are willing, willing to try. Willing, 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 yeah. willing this, this way. Um, uh, I'll change the subject slightly now, but another word that's come out a lot um, throughout this um, presentations is planning and the planning process I suppose and um, uh, my barometer get, get, I'm watching Country Farm as you do on the Sunday evening and um, there was a article about planning not going ahead I think it was in East Sussex and it was due to I think it was I think it was nature I'm not quite sure but it, it was integral basically the planning was not going ahead because there was an effect on the water table and it was quite an interesting article, and it stopped it stopped the planning process in its tracks. And I hadn't really taken on board that the water and the lack of water, which was on the water drawing from the from the table water table, was stopped the planning end of, and uh, was not going to go ahead until until they found a solution. Really, it was quite sort of uh, interesting, and it just made me think about the planning process. So I was just thinking, uh, Ben, from your point of view, the planning process. How do you? How how important is, is is this? All these issues to be built into the planning process, or, or, or do you think it's above that? I don't know. I don't. Or is it the government's problem? I don't know. How, how do we move forward on this? I mean, I think it's both. I mean, the government have obviously done an awful lot to date to introduce things like biodiversity offsetting, biodiversity gain, habitat banking, um, local authorities and planning system um, are kind of being told to do this and not necessarily told how. Um, so, I mean, it, it's hugely important that they're all involved, they all work in partnership with people, um, and I guess try and do whatever they can with the information they've got to try and get as much benefit for biodiversity as they possibly can. Right. And um, Julia, obviously representing the Town and Country Planning Association, wh wh what's your perception of this? Uh, you know whether we like it or not, there is a degree of politics involved in this, and the, I think it's a white paper at the moment, is it, on the bills, on the bills therefore is, you know, it, it, it's topical, and um, w w are these issues, as we talked about today, actually being discussed at the top table? Well, p planning is inherently political, because it's about how we use the scarce resources in the country how we use our land, how we, who gets what. So it's always going to be political. And people, quite rightly, will have something to say about it. So when people say, oh, planning's got, you know, the, the planning was delayed on this because somebody objected, and they see that as a fault, perhaps that's planning working as it should be, allowing people to voice their objections, allowing discussion. And it's always going to be a compromise. Um, but who has the power, as you mentioned, is hugely important. At the moment, I don't think communities do have much power because it, planning is inherently very complicated. Mm -hmm. For communities to be able to engage in it in an in a informed way where they can bring their experience and their knowledge requires a bit of support. And it takes time. And that's the other thing about partnership working. It takes time. So... Sometimes if things take a long time, that's not a failure, that's a success, that it means more people can be involved, more people get their say. Um, if we're really going to put the environment at the heart of planning, that does mean doing things differently, and that does mean that some things won't go ahead in the way that they used to. We, if it's just business as usual, we'll carry on creating the same problems as we've been creating for the last 30 or 40 years. So... There are going to be some crunchy, difficult bits where things don't happen as they've always happened. And um, perhaps we should see that as a sign of progress sometimes, even though it'll be difficult. Okay, interesting. Can, can I? Yep. Sorry, is that where green infrastructure... Do you just want to say where you're from and yes, yeah, um, your no, question? That'd be great. So, I, so I'm Robin Tucker. I'm one of the trustees uh, at Earth Trust here. Yep. And <coughs> kind of a, a set-up question. 
question for, for Jane. <laughs> um, is, is that where green inf infrastructure standards come in? Because so the question at the back, if it's just been asked, is mm -hmm. is that where green infrastructure <coughs> standards will come in? Standards will come in. Uh, because uh, I think they, they haven't been kind of firm standards up till now, and so no, open to interpretation. No. Whereas if you, if you set firm standards and they were mm -hmm. actually required, mm -hmm. developers would build them in from the start, yeah. which is the best yeah. way to build, yeah. build them in. Yeah. Um, so so the, the green infrastructure standards um, are going to be voluntary standards. They're going to be in the space of planning practice guidance. They are mentioned in the National Model Design Code. Um, and you know, we hope in time that, that they'll be mentioned in the National Planning Policy Framework. Um, but in answer to your question, I, I think a really key principle is to engage in a strategic way around planning for space places right at the start of the conversation. And that includes you know, the concept of the right development in the right space and place. And that part of that is considering the standards. But by having that really early conversation, these tensions can be ironed out in hopefully a win-win way um, so that you don't later down the line get this situation where you know something stops when uh, probably a massive amount of work has gone into it. And so in Natural England, we're starting to really focus all our energy at the outset of those conversations because we feel that's the place where we can have most influence um, and we can get the right decisions made then that will then flow out to the development um, further down the line. Um, any other questions? Yeah, a couple there, the man in the uh, white shirt. Yeah, just to say where you're from. And yeah. uh, Craig Transfield. So I think there's a microphone coming. Oh, fantastic, thank you. Um, Craig Transfield, um, Soha Housing Association. Um, Thanks very much for all your presentations. Really, really interesting stuff. Um, how do we get house builders really interested in this? I mean, at, at the moment, it's not an obligation. Um, it's voluntary if they do the green infrastructure or low carbon homes. Julia, do you want to uh, all right. answer yes. that? I don't know why it feels um, right, but you, you might look at me and go, uh, yep, no. Yeah, that's fine. So the housing market isn't like other markets. Um, if if you want to buy a car, you can look at a magazine or a website and it'll tell you, well, this car's quite good for that and this car's quite good for this, and you'll choose your car. With housing, if you need a home, you need a home and you need it in a particular place. So you will buy that home from that builder because that is a home in that place and maybe it's the only one you can afford. So there aren't the usual um, pressures to improve and to meet what the market wants because people desperate for homes, they will buy what's provided, whether they like it or don't like it very much. So the incentives aren't really there for the house builders. And I think that the only way to raise standards and to say, you know, to, to have the high quality green infrastructure that we need is to have it not as an option, <coughs> but as something that's mandatory, that has to be achieved. And if that's put into national planning policy, then that will mean that every single builder has to meet that standard. And so they'll all have to do it. They'll factor that into the price of land and they'll deliver it. Um, if it's optional, some will do it, some won't. It will happen in some places, probably the wealthier places with the higher land values. It won't happen in the poorer places with the lower land values <coughs> where the worst health is. So. The only way that we're going to get it to happen everywhere, including <coughs> the poorer places that need the green infrastructure so badly, is if it's in national planning policy as a requirement, not an option. Okay, that's very good. The question behind the man, the gentleman there, yeah. Do you want to take the microphone? Yes, my name is Richard Dick from Lucy Group, uh, an engineering firm in Oxfordshire. Connects uh, a lot of renewable energy sources, but in this also modestly builds houses and apartments in Oxfordshire. Following on from the last question, the panel haven't really answered, I think, uh, the question of if we build a thousand new homes in Vista or Whitney or whatever, in order to get uh, the biodiversity that you've described, which on a small scale in particular, I can't believe anybody doesn't agree with, how is that going to be achieved except, as I think the last panelist said, cutting down the number of houses 
uh, per, per acre. And who is going to pay for that, uh, given the, the high price of land? Because if not careful, we're going to push up the cost of houses at a time when, according to the government at least, we need many hundreds of thousands of new homes at affordable prices. I don't quite see how this circle is going to be squared. Thank you. OK, thanks very much. Um, ben, do you want to, in terms of the funding, what's your... Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to... Where, where's just, is it always someone over there who never actually arrives, or, 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 or is there a method of doing this? Yeah, I mean, there is. I mean, historically, obviously, we've, we've kind of followed a process that has had some successes, but largely has failed in terms of biodiversity. There's been a huge decline, huge, huge decline in species numbers, species diversity. So we can't just carry on doing what we've always done. Um, some of this agenda coming through the Biodiversity and Again agenda obviously is looking at trying to not just protect individual sites, individual species on sites, but actually take a pool of money, and not just small amounts of money, chunky money, that we can spend strategically. So, for example, here in Oxfordshire, you know, looking at nature recovery areas, um, where does that money come from? You know, it, it, will, it will largely come probably from Biodiversity and Again and developers. Um, but what the benefits will be is that you won't necessarily need to lose lots of housing units on your site. So the win for you is actually you'll still be able to buy, build biodiversity into your site, but you might be able to build more units than you'd expect and then offset the damage elsewhere where it's strategically you get the most benefit for biodiversity. Okay, that's great. Re Rachel? Yeah, I was just going to... Um I have no experience of the housing market at all, <laughs> but we've been working with healthcare organisations and one of, the, one of the first things we used to come up against 15 years ago was that this is going to cost us more. Um, and for years we made the financial argument that actually you know, it wasn't going to cost you more and we showed how that was the case. I don't know how, how much that's possible in this case, but people always... People, people obviously don't like change, and one of the arguments is always that this will cost more. Um, so maybe there's research to be done into the costs and into how that doesn't need to be more. Sometimes with medicines, for example, the costs have been more because that's been a less used thing, but if it was more used, the price would go down. So it's partly about the supply chain, isn't it? And, and who's, you know, if the plasterboard, which is specially made in Germany and has to be imported for, you know, an eco house is really expensive, can that be made somewhere else? Um, so supply, loss of supply chain work, a lot of engagement with people around uh, what the cost is, and then of course the kind of bigger question I suppose, which is what we're talking about in terms of all of this economics, is that we're not really actually putting the real costs in. So we want the outcomes of health and healthy place and so on, but we're not, we're not costing the inputs <coughs> properly. And so George Monbiot's thing of, of, you know, if we do, then prices will change. And the price of an expensive um, place without, ne or any place without um, uh, green space built in will actually cost more because of the health impacts on the people that live there, because of the damage that is being done to the environment. So it's kind of a, it can be a thing about economics. And for us in the health sector, what we've done is educate. So in the short term, waiting for mandatory stuff to come down from the top, we've done a lot of education of people who are making those decisions on the ground. So okay, in the, in that's the short great. term. Peter? D I just want to make a couple of points. And, and uh, you, you sort of um, pick up on a really, it's a, it's a really complex problem. And unfortunately, I think government policy around biodiversity net gain is, is trying to come up with quite a simple solution to a really complex problem because it doesn't really take into account that you know house building, uh, development. It, it's a it's a complex juggling thing between uh, land prices, land value, viability, uh, meeting existing uh, ob uh, objectives and policy requirements, and there'll be trade offs too. You know, we, we're now realising that I think when government introduced the idea of biodiversity net gain, there was this sort of assumption there'll be a lot of cheap land available to do the offsetting. We're now realising actually agricultural land value is actually going up because of the crisis in Ukraine. So it's really not be really understanding the complexity of the, uh, of the market in land. Um, and it's going to be a bumpy ride for the next couple of years as developers and landowners understand that relationship between um, the requirement of cheap biodiversity net gain 
and the market, which is what the government intends to, to develop, in offsetting. And um, there's this sort of, sort of simplistic notion that there will be these bits of land that are in nature recovery areas that will receive this fund and, and create areas of nature recovery, where actually the most of that land is in private ownership and there will be a market in that land. So not all of the offsetting would go into the areas where people expect it to go, because there'll be a market. And as a developer, quite rightly, you choose the option which is most beneficial to you. So it's going to be a really complex issue over the next two or three years as this policy actually lands in the real world. And again, I was a policymaker, and you know, policymakers do their very best to try and think through a complex problem, come up with a solution. It's only when it lands in the real world you kind of go, ah, oh, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> um, Gita, we've talked about vision, I suppose, in the sense of the right place and the right scheme. Do you think... Do you think people are listening? And if they're not listening, how can how can people how can that process be improved? I think sometimes we have agendas for listening. And if things don't match our agendas, we can quite easily switch off. I think it comes back to again, you need the right people in positions who will hear. Sometimes you you can't hear because you don't know what you're supposed to be hearing, almost. Um, so it's, for example, if my story w was always invisible because nobody knew what it was and I chose to keep it hidden, my nature story, because nobody saw it as valuable. So, you know, healing as a brown woman through nature because of intergenerational trauma or whatever it was, you know, that trauma was very different to my white counterpart example. So I think you have to have the right people who want to live, who are in positions, who know the stories, and you've got to want to listen, because we can have selective hearing, as I say to children in schools. <laughs> okay, that's really good. Right, we're just, we're, I'm conscious of time, because I'm going to gonna get a James there in a moment. Um, over there. Start at the back, the white and the white top, and then, we'll, and then we'll have one more question after that, the lady here, then. Right and then uh, I'm going to hand over to another Jane. So, uh, Rosie Rowe, I'm the head of Healthy Place Shaping at uh, Oxfordshire County Council. Um, just a, a couple of points. Um, we've talked a lot to, uh, so far about the benefits of um, access and connectivity to nature, and I'd just like to challenge that that I don't that there are some there are quite a lot of people who don't see that, that there are benefits, mm. uh, who don't want their children to go and enjoy muddy play because they can't afford to run a wash. They've only got one good set of clothes. They can't afford to go to a park because they're worried about the safety of their children doing that. So I think we've got to be really, um, we've got to challenge ourselves that not everybody sees benefits. Um, and we've got to really work with local communities, uh, as Gita says, to understand their stories and to understand how they do interact with nature and how we can support them and work with them at a neighbourhood scale, and we've talked a lot about big developments, that's really important, but actually it's, it's in, the, in the regeneration of our existing communities where those health inequalities exist that we've really got to take the, make those a priority. Um, and I'd just like to um, challenge the panel to give me some small-scale, quick wins to get this going. What would you say are the small-scale things we should be doing to really move this agenda forward. Okay, c c before we just do that, because I'm going to, the lady, uh, do you just want to do your question and then we'll go to the panel for, for both questions and then we'll call it a day. Sorry, um, hi everybody, my name's Lizzie. Thank you for really interesting presentations. I actually worked with Rosie um, at Oxfordshire County Council and the public health team. Um, my question was about the language and I'm really interested in this idea of the meta language of nature and the hierarchies that that, that creates. Um, and I guess I reflect quite regularly on how we in the West are still using, uh, could be called extractive language in terms of our relationship with nature, biodiversity net gain, ecosystem services, even stuff that Rosie and I are working on like um, green social prescribing, which is kind of uh, suggests that somebody has ownership of the spaces or the, or the things that we're trying to get people to connect with. Um, so my question is, um, is it too late to change that? 
Um, do we need to change it? Um, and what what can we do to change it? If um, sorry, I missed that. Too late to change what? Sorry. To, to change the language that we use the about language, right. uh, around, okay. around nature. Okay, fine. Okay, great. That's that's good. Um, Gita language seems to me yeah, an area like which you have particular. Yeah, it makes me think of like, about. for example, when I teach students teachers about poetry, and it's a genre that they often find really difficult. But when we when I have diverse students from different backgrounds, if I find language that interests them that's poetic, it might be rap poetry, it might be poetry from their own countries or whatever, I think we we need to think of language as evolving, and it can evolve. If you look at the way the dictionary evolves, you look at the way children use texting language, um, we need to go to people who have I don't like to use the word influencer necessarily, but who have that power to like to have that domino effect in their spaces with language. Um, you know, for example, you know, Mother Nature. I grew up knowing Mother Nature as or nature as Madhurti in Hindi, which means the Mother Earth. So, you know, the way I understand nature is first of all in a in a bilingual late way in Hindi because that's when it makes sense. Um, saying the Lord's Prayer in English never connected with me. So I might be saying it, the Lord's Prayer in my school in English, but in my head I was saying it in Hindi. So I think language is really powerful and who, who it comes back to this concept of knowledge, whose knowledge is powerful in this space as well. And language is really powerful. So when we, in policy, the language, the glossaries, all of that. Who chooses them? Okay, really interesting. Small gain win. Small gains. Mm. Depends who you're talking to. Thank you. Um, small gains. Um, who I'll, I'll yeah, small so, so what, one thing I've always been very impressed by um, when I was working in London is it's a couple of organisations. One called Thames Twenty One, uh, and um, uh, the other one I've forgotten right now. But anyway, <laughs> it's about <laughs> it's about taking people out into their local neighbourhood and really making them look at what's there. So Thames 21 do things called outfall safaris. They take people along a river and point out all the outfalls into the river to really help people understand that actually whatever you do in your house or if you're washing your car on your drive, it ends up in the river. Um, and also just doing a sort of basic uh, asset base of, of your local community. You walk around any local community and you'll see lots of bits of green space which are like, well, what are they for? You know, who, who owns it? What's it for? Often a bit of moan, I was coming here today, driving around a roundabout, huge great roundabout, constantly moan every two weeks. Why, why do we do that? Okay, that's very good. Right, um, I'm going to hand over to Jane Norris, but before that, I'm just going to thank our fantastic panel to Jane, Julia, Peter, Rachel, Ben, and Gita. Thank you very much for preparing notes, presenting the <laughs> Uh, Jane Norris uh, is going to wrap up, so hand over to Jane. Gosh, hello, I'm glad I didn't have to answer some of those questions. <laughs> um, I'm Jane Norris, I'm a director of Edgar's, we're a planning consultancy based in Oxfordshire, and I'm also a board member on Oxlep, so my chair of the Clean Growth Subgroup. Um, Fantastic speakers, such a range of topics to consider, but all so, so relevant, and really made me think, and I hope they've made everybody in the room think. So uh, Jane um, asked me last week, I think it was, when I just came back off holiday, to, to summarise and to um, give a call to action. And I think we do have a moment of opportunity to make a change here. Uh, there is public awareness. COVID has really been... Um, shifted our reality and shifted uh, how we think about things and it's really made us think about what's important to us be it uh, well-being or wh whatever aspect nature has to us I think it has a greater value than it ever had before uh, we are in a re realms of national legislative change at the moment there's the Environment Act um, requirement for biodiversity gain which we've already heard about today the levelling up and regeneration bill there are opportunities within there in terms of consultation and I'd urge you all to really keep a close eye on what's happening there because there is opportunities to comment on what's coming from the government so in terms of design codes 
the emphasis on the environment um, and also the relevance that the National Planning Policy Framework has within the consideration of planning applications. It will have far greater emphasis, um, it's proposed to have far greater emphasis than it currently has at the moment. So really, really driving that change um, through consultation is really important. There's a lot of change locally with the Oxfordshire plan um, and there's um, a huge amount of political and I think public will for zero carbon, which I, I know that's slightly different, but it all adds to the same thing. Um, you've got fantastic examples here locally um, about how zero carbon can occur and in the Earth Trust, you're, you've actually got a clear agenda for how we can address biodiversity. You know, Oxfordshire is, is an area where innovation and doing things differently is absolutely at the forefront. It's at the forefront of the vaccine development and there's no reason why the room ahead of me um, and the brains within it and the opportunity to collaborate and share experiences and problem solve um, can't be done. It, it requires a number of things though. And for me today, I think the, one of the things I hadn't written down before I came um, and it has really struck me is the need for humility and to actually understand that we don't understand everything and everybody has a different perspective. And by actually having that humility, you will be able to listen more and actually hear better uh, the perspectives of other people and actually take on board what they can do and what they can bring to the table to make us understand things better. So I think we need to understand the issues. We need to probe and find out what's really required uh, for all. Please make representations um, when there's an opportunity at the national planning policy level. Um, I know that the uh, Town and Country Planning Association and the RTPI, and I know there's people here from that organisation as well, um, as well as, individual, as, well as individuals, sh should really, really contribute towards that. So let's keep the discussion current. We do need to collaborate and we need to keep collaborating. It doesn't matter if the conversation is difficult. The conversation has to keep going because I think we, we are at a critical, critical point. And I think planning in nature from the outset and going back to design codes um, and certainly what you've been talking about today is absolutely critical. Um, when we were talking at an OPSLEP conference a few weeks ago about uh, zero carbon build, we were talking about um, everything that's built from now on without the zero carbon agenda being taken into account is a retrofit <coughs> problem and the same applies to biodiversity. And I actually think that, forgive me, I may be wrong, but I think biodiversity is probably harder to work with it, uh, probably, than the zero carbon agenda. But together, they actually have to, to happen. So uh, let's use this talent and knowledge to create something really much better for everybody. So um, please, I encourage you, um, each of you, to take something professional and personal away today and make a commitment to make a difference. Advocate to colleagues and get them to come and visit here. The Earth Trust will show you examples of how you can build differently, how we can approach wildlife and biodiversity differently. Um, and it's a fantastic resource for the new generation to actually learn new skills um, and connect with nature. Now, I know, I know we may be here to network, but I think all of us care. Um, so I think, um, an opportunity is, is only that unless we actually take action. So please, I'd encourage you to all take action, however small it may be, to make change. And to use Jane's words is focus, get up and go. So um, I encourage you to do that. Focus, get up and go.